Thank you and welcome back or welcome to this new session if you've just joined us um, where we discuss protecting wildlife through technology and law enforcement. Uh, if you have just joined us from a previous session you'll know we were looking at the the value which can be attributed to individual elephants which if left to go about that business in the forest far far exceeds anything you can get from cutting off these front teeth that I've got protruding from my left shoulder of this fine forest elephant. He's alive and well and in the forest still. And if he lives his full life, then the carbon sequestration attributable to him would be $1.75 million or more as the price of carbon goes up. So here's the challenge for our panel uh, now is how do we monitor these elephants? How do we protect them from the misguided people who think that chopping off the front teeth that brings in a few tens of thousands of dollars if they're lucky or a few hundred dollars if the, uh, the bottom end of the the trade chain uh, is the only way they're going to uh, benefit from this this amazing creature behind me so i'm joined for this discussion with gautam shah who's a founder of the internet of elephants now there's a tantalizing title i'll get you to introduce what that is about uh, shortly um, Sarah Maston, who's the founder of Microsoft Project 15, which I learned about recently and is very exciting, so I'm really pleased you've been able to join us. And Dr. Timothy Wittig, uh, who is uh, working with uh, United for Wildlife um, and is particularly interested in, in the intelligence in the sense of gathering information to help enforce the law. I hope I've encapsulated very briefly what you're about. Can, can I follow that same order? Uh, Gautam, would you like to introduce your work to the audience? You'll have to unmute yourself. Myself, there we go. Yeah. Yes, hello everybody. Thanks very much, Ian. Um, yeah, absolutely. We, we, uh, I run a company called Internet of Elephants. It's um, the, the wildlife conservation space and the space that I'm in is definitely not where I used to be. So I spent 20 years as, a, as an IT consultant for Accenture. Um, before I finally made the decision to quit and kind of pursue a life of passion around wildlife and conservation um, and figure out, you know, what are the ways that technology can play a role, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in doing so. Um, and so we are, we are entirely on the public engagement side of things, right? And so I'd always kind of felt like, well, if I could do anything to get the world engaged, I would just pick up 8 billion people and, you know, in order, plop them in the middle of the, you know, the, the forest in Borneo. Um, and, you know, in 10 to 15% of them would be, you know, would be changed people. And that, that would have a massive impact. But, but short of us being able to do that, uh, uh, you know, how could I do whatever we could to use technology to try and create the same emotions, to create the same connections, to, to figure out how can an individual in St. Louis uh, be connected with that forest elephant that's right, you know, that's right behind you, uh, uh, that's thousands of miles away, and 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 you know, in a way, create a relationship with wildlife that just you know that just doesn't exist today. Um, so that's that's you know that's effectively what Internet of Elephants does. The name Internet of Elephants is this idea that if people can be connected to people, if people can be connected to their refrigerators, their cars, etc what would happen and how would it change in the world if people could be connected to Moituria the elephant or Fio the orangutan or uh, Ashaya the jaguar. Um, so what we essentially do, and maybe I'll just, uh, I'll just share uh, something to make it uh, somewhat clearer. Um, is that coming through? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So everything that everything that we do is based on real wildlife data and real wildlife science. We're not the scientists. We're not the ones that go out and do the research. But effectively, there's unbelievable amounts of science research data being collected everywhere, and that's just a, a gold mine of information, a gold mine of stories, and a gold mine of opportunities. And so. You know, I use this picture to say, like, we take everything that's typically going into a scientific journal and we start converting it into playable uh, interactions, ways that the overall general public can actually get involved in that science in a way that's very consumable for them, fun for them, and, and, and a way for them to connect. And that typically translates into games, data visualizations, and other types of, you know, other types of interactive media. So... Wildiverse was a game about uh, uh, being a researcher in Borneo or in Ndoki National Park in, in, in the Congo and, and, and studying specifically for 
real individual apes and, and all the information and everything that comes through in augmented reality and wildiverse is about, you know, is about being that researcher. Stories of the wild are, are, are data visualizations uh, based entirely on GPS movements of an elephant, uh, a pair of lions, uh, sisters, and, 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 a, and, a, and a herd of wildebeest. Um, Unseen Empire documents 10, 10 years worth of camera trap studies in Southeast Asia on the clouded leopard and actually you know, brings that all to you. And now you have to play the researcher and actually go ahead and ID these photographs, set up the sites and, and, and know what that's really like. But in the process, you get to see spectacular camera trap images along the way. And Hollers and Growlers, it's not, it's not out yet, but it's something that we're working on that's all about trying to mimic uh, animal vocalizations uh, in, in the wild, but again, in a social sort of party atmosphere. So this is the, you know, these are the types of things that we're doing entirely. How, how do we use tech? How do we use new mediums? How do we use new platforms to try and create massive public engagement with, with wildlife and its conservation? I will uh, stop there. Thank you. Thank you. So, so clearly technology is coming into it, and, and I don't know if anyone else is going to talk about VR, but uh, <laughs> that offers people the chance to literally be uh, immersed in mm -hmm. a, an ecosystem. Um, if you've got your headphones on and, and your peripheral vision is fooled with a three, 360 image. Um, so there's a website called Vicotourism, V for virtual ecotourism.org, mm -hmm. where we've been experimenting with that. Um, Sarah, tell us a little bit about Project 15, which um, comes oh, from no. within the Microsoft Corporation, as I understand it. We all, we're all used to dealing with Microsoft products, but how how is Microsoft helping elephants and other species? Hi. Um, I first, I'm so happy to be here, and uh, that's a good question. Um, yes, I were. I don't. I'm following the coolest game that I just you know am learning about the other day. I'm like, whoa. Um, so yes, I'm Sarah. I'm a solution architect uh, at Microsoft. I focus generally on you know what Gautam just said about connecting to your refrigerator or having an experience with your car um, or these smart systems. My day job is to create those systems uh, and work with the data and, and making things happen up on the Microsoft Azure cloud. However, uh, one day I found a way to apply one of the systems I had made into conservation, and that led to what we're talking about here today, Project 15. And so I have some slides to share um, to bring you sort of through a bit of an origin story journey um, and also can help to explain a little bit what it means when I say IoT uh, solution architect. You may not be familiar with the term IoT. It stands for Internet of Things and those connected things, devices sending information. So let me just share with you if I can get this to work. Um, all right, so Project 15 from Microsoft uh, really was an aha moment. I invite you to go out. We have a little video that explains a little bit of the origin story that I'm going to cover here. And before I get into what it is, I will tell you a, a true fact is that this all starts with my cat. Um, she looks very angry. And the reason she looks angry is because there was a fire in my apartment building. And I ran into this building to save her. So I saw a lot of smoke. I lived in this building complex. I saw a lot of smoke. I panicked and there was no bell yet. And I ran in and I saved my cat and I ran back out. And the next day I went to the office and I said, what was that? That was really scary. And they said, oh, I don't know why you were upset. That fire was really far away from you. And I went, what? And then it turned out that the smoke had been blown across the garage floor that connects all the buildings. And that's what I saw. So they told me the fire had been out for 20 minutes. And I pretty much jumped up and down and, you know, uh, was, you know, got upset. And I said, there has to be a way to communicate better in an emergency to people within the emergency. And that led to a project called Project Edison. And how it worked in a proof of concept way is that if you think about a smart bulb and you know a map and here's this pin on the map and here's Joanne and Joanne is in a meeting room with a light bulb and the system knows where the light bulb is. So if something happened where Joanne, 
Joanne is on a campus, she could be within a radius of awareness to an event. And now her light bulb has turned yellow. And that means don't panic, don't stress. Something has happened, but it's not near you. Please go make decisions and get more information. If it happens closer to her, then it turns red and she can do her safety drill. So it may occur to you that this is a safety platform, and it is, and it was for safe schools and workplaces. And we put it out on open source, um, and our partner ecosystem, some people built solutions on that idea, and there's actually a safe school system running in Houston, Texas, uh, based on that idea right now. And then I met Dr. Eric Dinnerstein, who uh, has a solution called TrailGuard, and many of you may be familiar with Eric and his work. And I learned that he had a camera trap that could detect poachers. And when it did, it would send an alert up to a system, which would then tell the rangers to go, you know, help the animals. And in my head, I thought, oh my God, this is the same use case as a safe school or a safe retail or safe factory. So I started to apply it to you know those use cases and really what's the difference between loss prevention of a shirt or a sweater in a store and loss prevention of a pangolin in a park and so really there might be a way for the commercial uh, solutioning community of technologists to come in and help the scientific projects to accelerate them and one of the things that we've done and released recently is called the Open Platform for Conservation and Ecological Sustainability. And this is an 80% solution that we put out on GitHub. So it's free, you can download it and then you, you build upon it and then you pay for your cloud consumption, of course, but the base solution is free. It's made by myself and my colleague, Daisuke Nakahara. And think of it as a typewriter. So if you're gonna write a book, 80% of that solution of writing a book is the typewriter, the word processor, and 20% is your story, and that's your use case. So we really just made a fancy typewriter for uh, sustainability solutions. And I'm just gonna end with, you know, we did it to accelerate, we did it to lower the cost of development. Microsoft's mission is to empower every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. And so this is how my little team of friends within Microsoft wanted to empower these solutions and help. And we are now uh, partnered with the Small Grants Program, GEF Small Grants Program, implemented by the United Nations Development Program uh, to be able to help and, and, and scale out some of their grantee projects. So it's pretty exciting. Well, uh, th thank you. That is pretty exciting. <laughs> yes. So Let's, anyway. Um, OK, here we are. So, new technology, new ideas, new connections, um, all of which must be music to the ears of you, Tim, uh, in that you're, you're trying to help um, solve the, the challenge, come up with a solution to the challenge of um, wildlife trafficking, which is people who, for, I guess, in their minds, perfectly valid reasons, are taking a different course of action, which involves killing animals, trafficking them around the world, uh, and uh, risking arrest and imprisonment and even being shot by law enforcement officials with that different um, agenda. How do we apply these new technologies? Okay, great. <clears throat> Thank you, Ian, um, and thanks, Sarah and Gautam, for um, re really interesting projects. And gr great to learn about them. Um, so let me um, uh, talk about uh, what we're doing with Focus Conservation and also United for Wildlife. Um, I'm a, a head of intelligence for, for, uh, for both. Um, um, Initiatives actually, I work for uh, Focus Conservation and, and implement uh, the uh, the United for Wildlife Task Force, uh, Private Sector Task Force Intelligence Sharing System. So I'll talk about and um, it, just my background. I've worked in the intelligence community. I was a I was an analyst, also been in academia, uh, and also worked um, with a couple with many tech partners and data scientists, uh, including at Johns Hopkins University and, and things. So I think um, it's it's been really interesting. And I'll talk about I think probably the human dimension of, of tech of technology, which I think is really important uh, about kind of making this uh, into practice. So here's kind of the problem statement I see for wildlife trafficking. So wildlife trafficking being you know. Um, uh, if you include timber, probably 100 and 150 billion dollar a year uh, illicit industry, um, you know, third or fourth biggest 
illicit trade in the world at, at the time, at, at, right now. Um, and so the uh, and, and so the problem statement, kind of the, the solution is that we have to work together um, across sectors. So across private sector, NGOs, conservation groups, law enforcement, government. Um, and, and we really can't be successful unless we do that. And so I think that's kind of a, a really um, maybe unique, but a critical thing about wildlife trafficking. So this causes a lot of complications though, is because uh, law enforcement and government, they have the authorities to, to take down wildlife trafficking networks, um, but often they lack the information uh, to do so, or, or even the mandate um, or, or sometimes the interest. NGOs are very passionate about, about doing something about this issue, but you know, they're NGOs, they're non-governmental, so they don't have the, uh, you know, NGOs are um, not supposed to be you know, collecting intelligence um, or, um, or you know, obviously they don't arrest people or things. And also the private sector, uh, you know, so, uh, they're really a critical component too because um, all, pretty much all illegal wildlife moves commercially, right? So it all goes on ships uh, or airplanes um, and 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 it's all about money, obviously. So it's all the proceeds of that crime, uh, you know, goes into the financial system in one way or the other at some point. So those are really key bottlenecks um, around that. So this was the genesis. Uh, actually, we're on March fifteenth will be the five year anniversary of this initiative. Uh, so Prince William, Duke of Cambridge, and William Hague, former Foreign Secretary of the of the UK. Uh, so they came together and convened um, a, what's called United for Wildlife uh, Task Forces, private sector task forces. And like there, it says to create a framework to assist the private sector in, in, in combating the illegal wildlife trade. Okay, so a big, uh, uh, I'd say the major operational component of this. So there's there's commitments that are signed by the companies, um, but the major operational component of, of this is the intelligence sharing system, and that's what um, th that's what I've been running since the beginning, uh, and now we're running through Focus Conservation. Uh, and I think it's a really interesting thing, um, and I think it, it has a lot to do with technology too. So here are, here's a listing of our members, current members of, from the banking world, financial task force members. So I think it's about 45 banks now uh, and about 130, over 130 transport companies. So airlines, shipping, airports, uh, things like that. And so again, these, these companies sign these agreements and then, uh, and then one of the big agreements is that they act on intelligence that's, sharing, uh, that's shared with them. And, they, and also something that's evolved is that there's now uh, we act as kind of a, an honest broker conduit between law enforcement, private sector, and NGOs. Um, so we're um, <clears throat> so here's a kind of the obligatory diagram for how this works. So we have member companies, we have enforcement partners, we have kind of the you know broader ecosystem of policy and conservation groups. I think the key thing is that trusted neural network. So it's this human, it's this really uh, human network of, of people okay, that makes all of this possible. Um, so from a technological standpoint, tech is a big part of this. Um, and so, so I think you know, one of the messages I want to is show is that um, how humans and human networks and, and, and technology and technical networks work together is really, I think, uh, is, you know, is really kind of the answer to the question. Um, <clears throat> and so here are the kind of the, the critical elements that I see is that information is meant to be shared, right? It's not, information doesn't do anyone, anyone any good if it's, if it's hoarded. And this is a, you know, I think this is kind of a perennial problem in the conservation sector is that information is often seen as a, almost a commodity to raise funds off of rather than um, a lifeblood that, you know, the, to really share. Um, and then there's also kind of a lot of real world um, limitations about, you know, your you have amazing databases and, and amazing technical capabilities from a lot of our partners. Microsoft is actually one of our partners, um, but that uh, you know the the issues of firewalls and uh, proprietary information, customer information, privacy, uh, GDPR, even uh, you know th these things are you know they're they're really real world constraints. And so I think the answer to this actually is this human um, network, uh, this neural network, right? And also setting and setting up mechanisms. That are that work within existing authorities, existing laws, um, but that are very effective about uh, sharing information. So this is what we've been focused on for the last five years, and I think we've been pretty successful at. Uh, so, so the way this is done is that you know, we, it, it's, it's a lot of human interaction, a lot of building up trust, trusted networks, um, and then kind of bringing in technology uh, to fill specific gaps, especially as you're trying to scale things. Uh, you know, because we can be very effective on an ad hoc level, um, just kind of, you know, even using basic technologies um, 
but then uh, if you can scale this, I mean, in order to scale this so that we can have strategic impact on on wildlife trafficking, um, then then we really do need technology. So here's here's actually an example of the, uh, the the thing at the top with the rhino horns. Um, that's uh, that's from a uh, Microsoft and Heathrow Airport um, and, and United for Wildlife program called Project Seeker. Uh, that's been that's been uh, it's about um, using AI to uh, automatically detect illegal wildlife in uh, during the baggage screening process. You know for uh, for airports. IATA, the the industry association, um, is supportive of this, and they actually have a parallel project that's similar, um, and it's being scaled out in um, in Africa and Asia too. Um, and so I think that's that's been a that's been a great uh, and that that that's been a great initiative and it's also an ex example of kind of the stuff that we're doing um, <clears throat> that we can use technology to scale these out. There's a great quote about um, artificial intelligence AI that I think is uh, that I think is, is good to remember is that um, AI is anything cool computers can do, which is hard to explain to lay people. I think that's a great kind of definition of AI because a lot of stuff that was called AI. 10 years ago is now just called uh, statistics or or other things. So I think AI is kind of an umbrella term for um, advanced data-driven scalable you know, solutions. Um, so just an example of what this can lead to, the, the positive things. Uh, you know, five, 10 years ago, you know, in most cases when wildlife was seized, you, know, you have big wild, uh, illegal wildlife seizures, you know, multiple tons of ivory or pangolin or, or whatever, uh, often, that, well, that used to be the end of the story. Um, and so through our mechanisms, through our human network and also the, the tech network of the intelligence sharing, uh, this is a great example. This is the biggest seizure, I think, in Uganda's history. Um, and then so we were, through our relationships with the um, uh, the shipping companies that were actually shipping, the, processing the shipment, as well as banks, as well as law enforcement, and as well as NGOs, uh, we were able to take the shipment and then within uh, 24, 72 hours even, we were able to identify other shipments, um, 31 other containers that were connected to the shipment or to the suspects. Uh, and then we we're also able to uh, catalyze, you know, searches and, and interdictions of those shipments. So it's it's a great example about how this kind of, inter, um, the proper connection between the human element and the tech element and the information sharing element can really um, make a difference. And I think overall, I think this may be something we're hearing from a lot of people is that I think what's happening is that there's a redefining of who is a conservationist now. So I think, um, you know, kind of the uh, <clears throat> vision often that we have is that a conservationist is someone, you know, in the field, maybe in Africa specifically, uh, you know, working, uh, you know, they're a biologist or a scientist. And that's a, obviously a critical component of conservation. But I think what we're seeing is that whether you're a tech person or a bank person or a transport shipping company or, or whatever, law enforcement, uh, DEA agent, <clears throat> um, uh, Focus Conservation is uh, founded by by a few ex-DEA agents uh, that are working 100% on wildlife now. So what we're seeing is that all these people that are kind of non-traditional, uh, people that you wouldn't kind of put the conservationist label on, actually are having amazing conservation impact. You know, so I think this is a broader point that, you know, we're, we're really in the process of redefining who is a conservationist and that actually a lot of people and a lot of technologies that maybe even aren't aren't designed for this purpose can actually have really great uh, impact, you know, for saving wildlife. So, thank you. Stop there. Thank you, Tim. That's very uh, very focused, <laughs> as one would expect. Um, and and that last point is so true. Um, I remember when I was a, a young biologist in in. Kenya, one of the old guard conservationists who, of course, was ex-military, was chuntering about too many ruddy zoologists in conservation. Um, and now when I uh, hear people asking me about how to get a career in conservation, I'm more likely to say, well, couldn't you just include conservation in your career? Mm. And clearly, all three of our panelists today have come to this from a different career. And, and really, conservation has got to get out of the, the public has got to see it as something that applies to all of us. We all have to play a role in conservation if this is going to work, this, this, this attempt to redefine our relationship with, with nature. So the, the comments I've been seeing coming in have all been very excited about the application of, of technology, uh, and it is, it is true, but, but even with the best will in the world, uh, technology can go wrong. Um, you know, we've had one or two of the speakers here and suddenly freeze up. Uh, so how reliable is the technology, and, and particularly if you're in a delicate operation, 
uh, as in intelligence-led uh, attempt to arrest someone, and and the power goes down, the the the, the sensors go off. That must. Uh, I don't know if you've had that problem, but but almost everyone listening on this call from wherever they are in the world will know what I'm talking about. For us, it's a mild inconvenience. That could be a matter of life and death. But um, Tim, you're muted, so you have to. If you're going to tell us a story, or... <laughs> I was just agreeing with you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I was I was going to say, you know, this is where, as the worlds are com combining, you know, the the tech has caught up. I, I think with being able to do such amazing things and what we call is the intelligent edge. Um, so when you're putting, you know, intelligence into a camera that can see this is a poacher, this is a elephant, you know, the difference, that's that machine learning, that AI um, that, that uh, Timothy was talking about. Um, it, when those things go offline, you know, the commercial space has come up with you know, many ways to deal with that because think about a smart car. You can't have that go offline while you're driving. And if there's a little micro uh, computer in there that's like, hey, you know, do I need to deploy an airbag? You need that to be going all the time. There is no failure. And so um, I just want to just like, it's kind of a general comment that, you know, those technologies are advancing to to bring in those stop gaps especially in the sensor uh device world and that keeps uh getting better and better as the technology increases <laughs> fingers are firmly crossed on that one um yeah and i think i think maybe some principles that i mean they hold true for technology for everything and and uh and it's any kind of technology not just not just uh digital or information technology but yeah, I mean, garbage in, garbage out, I think is a good, you know, it's, it's a core principle. If you have, you know, if you have good information and good relationships, uh, you know, then, then the outputs are going to be much higher quality. <laughs> um, the best technology is the one that people use. You know, I think that's another guiding principle, you know, so you can have really good technology, but if for whatever reason, you know, even just bandwidth, uh, internet bandwidth is an issue in Africa, a lot of, with our, a lot of our law enforcement partners there, you know, they just don't have reliable internet. So having a, a bandwidth hungry technology is, you know, it's not necessarily useful for them. Uh, yeah. So I think, you know, it's like kind of the, the core principles that apply to all technologies. Yeah. We have to um, abide by those two in conservation. But airports, let, let me just challenge you on that because airports and seaports are both normally well equipped with technology, you know, planes and ships come in and out and, and most countries now have computer computerized trade records. Hmm. Um, I, I recall seeing a presentation, I can't remember the name of the chap, who was pointing out that every suitcase going onto a plane is x-rayed, but the people are just looking for bombs. They don't want the plane to explode. But if they were told to look for suspicious items, and we know that a huge amount of bushmeat comes into Europe in personal baggage. If people were just told, never mind, you know, yes, look out for bombs, but look out for skeletal patterns too, or, or as you, your, your thing showed, rhino horns, although if it's cut up in, in, in little segments, it's more difficult to identify. But the existing technology isn't being used to best effect. And another example of that is a, a friend of mine called Mark Laxer uh, has a company, Data Mining International, and, and they have software that goes through trade records and, and looks for anomalies, which are often associated with crime. And so you could decide which of the thousands of containers going through a port you want to look at because it's not the same weight as every other container that went through supposedly containing the same stuff. And we've tried to give that away to developing countries so that they can do exactly that, focus their customs offices on the, the likely illegal shipments. And it's like, I don't know, pushing water uphill. Um, which led someone to suggest, um, one of your founders, uh, that perhaps th those in a position of authority don't actually want that much technology that might expose things that they or their friends or families might be involved in. Uh, <laughs> I'm just throwing that out as, a, as a, one of the challenges we face. Definitely. And also there's a, you know, there's always an arms race too with technology where, uh, Criminals adapt, you know, to, uh, to new tech too, right? So, so like, 
you know, there's a lot of corruption in ports, um, but it's a, a new kind of insider threat issue and corruption is that uh, is is people um, bribing people for their passwords so that they can actually go into the, the databases themselves and issue legitimate shipping documents uh, that are that are fraudulent or bypassing uh, scanning procedures or, or things like that. You know, so uh, so on the on the platform, everything looks uh, legitimate, but is, there's actually been some human. Yes, well, we, we've been using that phrase in, in developing uh, rebalanced Earth that we, we don't need a foolproof system, we need a conniving bastard proof system because there's someone out there looking for the chink in the armor and, and bribing people for passwords is a very good example of that. But more and more people are potentially involved in this. Is there a way, um, go to Tam, that, that we can sort of gamify this and bring the wider public in? Because people play um, games which challenge them in a virtual world. I, I kind of want people to take the VR off and go outside and enjoy the real world. But while they're in there playing, um, can you use your ingenuity when you've unmuted yourself to tell us <laughs> whether there's a, a chance of... Um, you know, we, we hear a lot about citizen science involving the public in science, and there's huge amounts of data, but there's huge numbers of people sitting at home in the bedroom who could potentially be using their computer, their brain, through their yeah. laptop or device to help. How, how can we gamify and help uh, Tim with his uh, work in, in intelligence gathering or monitoring shipments of containers or something? Yeah, well, that's, that's a, I mean, that's a fantastic question, and it, you know, it, gets, uh, it gets a lot into... Um... You know the benefit, the benefits and possibilities of citizen, you know, of citizen science, which which I think is which which has incredible incredible potential. Just kind of speaking from an area of expertise, none of what we do is on the citizen science side of stuff. What we do is we we'll take we take the science and try and engage people with stuff that's already been you know been determined. But I, I, I look at I look at the engagement side and what games can do on the engagement side to to really activate people in in terms of. How, how, how does people's behavior impact markets? How does people's behavior and the will of citizens impact policy? How does the will of citizens impact the amount of available financing that can go into the projects that, that, you know, that support the interventions on the ground? If the general public is not engaged with it, doesn't feel activated by it, doesn't feel efficacy, uh, uh, around anything that they do and is generally bombarded with doom and gloom campaigns um, or, uh, uh, you know, things that make, you know, make them very, very passive. Um, I think we've just got a long road in front of us in terms of anything actually, you know, anything actually changing. So the, the way that we really, we really look at games is, okay, there's a number of people that are happy to watch a nature documentary, but how many people would actually be, you know, potentially more interested in engaging through a game which, you know, brings across the same information as a nature documentary does, but now makes them feel part of the solution, makes them feel like they can think about ideas, makes them feel like something that they're doing is helping an orangutan in Borneo or something that they're doing is, you know, is, is, is helping a sea turtle swimming, you know, swimming through the Red Sea. So that's that's the you know that's where we see the power uh, uh, the power of games is really this feeling of I'm part of this. It's not just these people telling me a story and telling me what to think and telling me that conservation is important and telling me that an orangutan needs to be saved and telling me that palm oil is bad, but it's giving me the opportunity to actually play a part of that story to you know to to, to feel like I have you know that I have a role in it. And that's what we think has the, the downstream impact or the upstream, I don't know what's the right word, upstream or downstream impact on the, you know, the products that are sold in the market, what people are buying, how people are behaving, the amount of finance. You know, I think we all know that the amount of philanthropic dollars that actually go to nature and wildlife is, a, is just tiny, right? Now, you know, how does, this start to, how does this start to shift this? And how does this start to actually start getting in front of politicians and saying like, hey, wait a second, everybody is interested all of a sudden in wildlife. Uh, everybody's playing these wildlife games in the same way that everybody was watching Game of Thrones, et cetera. How does that change the way that I might think about policies in my country? Because my people are now telling me that they're interested, uh, you know, via these, via these different platforms. It sounds like the modern version, when, when radio soap operas were first invented as a drama series, the idea was mm -hmm. to educate people about 
farming methods with the archers in England. It's still running as a radio series mm -hmm. on, on the BBC, but um, games are a new way of perhaps bringing that information into the, especially the younger generation. That's what um, just had a comment here from uh, Kate Gilman Williams. Uh, don't forget our younger generation can save wildlife and wild spaces. In fact, we must, by the time I turn 25 years old, all elephants might be gone. You're right. Um, teaching technology to kids is is key. Uh, and, I, and I agree with her in terms of gaining their attention because they the younger generation seem, seem, you know, they don't watch telly across the living room anymore. They watch stuff in the palm of the hand. Um, but it's the connecting that to the real world. It seems so distant. And that exactly. I, I don't know how, exactly right. to what extent your games do explain that. I don't know if some of the purchase price goes to help the, the animals, but um, I, I, just a, a heads up um, next month, all being well, we'll be launching a new uh, streaming channel called EcoFlix. Uh, mm -hmm. Where your subscription actually goes to pay for conservation. Yeah. Um, so the, the only shareholders are the animals, uh, which mm -hmm. is, a, a, and I'd love to talk to you separately offline about getting your games Absolutely. onto there because games and viewing videos and consuming content is is what everyone seems to want to do now to reach out to people. But if we can get a, a significant stream of the revenue into the people who are either living alongside or protecting those animals. That's what we need to do. Um, a comment from uh, Chip Commons, uh, can Sarah uh, and Microsoft and, and Dr. Wittig et al apply this amazing thinking and innovation to create a technology stroke app tracking deforestation and ultimately the burning and forcing of man-made CO2 and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere now collapsing the global biosphere. So it's, it's all in you guys create the technology to not just monitor, but then enable the response to prevent the, the negative things that are happening. Uh, uh, no pressure. So, um, yes. Okay. So, you know, when you, I do a lot of uh, speaking around Microsoft's stance on sustainability, you know, bigger than Project 15, the stuff I'm doing. Um, and we're really focused, I know we don't have a lot of time today, but um, the four main categories that uh, at least uh, Microsoft has gone really big on, especially this year with some big announcements is carbon and energy, water, waste, and then ecosystems. And agriculture um, and land uh, falls under ecosystems. And that's kind of the corner where Project 15 is sitting along with uh, such amazing um, groups in, in Microsoft called you know, AI for Earth, AI for Good. Um, so when you think about IoT and these devices, like the devices are going to drive sustainability because they're going to get all those measurements to do what you know what you're talking about can we get it so that we have the solutions so then we can take action and do something and then it reduces it and you get that feedback loop um just like if i go into a store and i have you know something that knows i got there and it sends me a notification that's a that's a feedback loop um and so i i think i mean the answer to that question is broadly Yes. Um, and, and so that's, I mean, that's what I spend my days and nights uh, focused on. And I just wanted to, um, you know, put in a comment to about the game. Um, I have actually, now that I've been on this learning journey for a little over a year, that's so important um, to get people to think differently about their local animals. Like, uh, you know, the work you're doing, if you can get, especially the children, um, there might be some old wives tales, as they're called, around, you know, those animals come into my town and they wreak havoc, so we have to get rid of them or something. And it's false. Like, those animals are just hanging out and they just walked through or something. And so I think it's just so important, the work, um, you know, that Gautam's doing in terms of that evangelism for mindset change, which then speaks to what uh, Timothy is saying around, you know, communities who are allowing it to happen. So I just wanted to say that, like, it's, in my mind, at least, it's just so connected that if we can all become, like you said, Ian, conservation comes into our jobs from wherever we sit, that that is how we are going to fix these huge problems um, in general. 
<laughs> could be a great out, but we've still got 10 minutes. So, so do, do come in, Tim. <laughs> yeah, the one thing I was going to add is, um, you know, you know, I think a, a lot of the the real promise of of technology is is on is on these data driven, you know, solutions. But I think one of one of the kind of dirty secrets of conservation is that the data ecosystem is really pretty poor, right? And so we need we need better data sets. You know, so I think this is this is a to put it you know simply. So that's it's a huge problem actually. So like CITES, you know, for example, CITES has a lot of data uh, about kind of um, you know um, yeah traded species and things, but it, it's not it's not a very well structured data set. Uh, you know, they they don't even record seizures in the same way. Some is by volume, some is by uh, weight, some is by value um, pieces. You know, uh, there's no data set, for example, of <clears throat> of what what species is legally traded in what country. You know, um, what species is, you know, there's a lot of restrictions about captive bred species are okay to trade, but not if they're wild caught. But are there, are there any captive breeding facilities, you know, for a specific species? You know, so all that type of data. Uh, there's a great initiative in, uh, that Oxford is doing right now called Benchmark for Nature. Uh, that's, that's trying to improve some of this data, this data environment uh, focused on investors, right? So that invest, so that that data can, can uh, on, impacts on, on investment and economic activity um, uh, and investments, you know, impact on nature and, and it's actually science-based. Um, so I think that's that's a great initiative. There's a lot of stuff actually going on in the kind of sustainable finance field on the data side, which is really interesting. And I would just say if anybody's out there listening that is looking for a topic for a master's degree or a PhD, you know, uh, developing a, a useful data set would be, you know, it, it would be great, you know, so you can do that. <laughs> Why not put it out into the universe? The universe will hear. Um, it, it just strike me though, as you were just talking uh, about the difference between captive bred and wild and so on, that, that's very pre-COVID thinking. Because to a virus, it doesn't matter whether it's captive bred, legal, illegal, sustainable, unsustainable, it's an opportunity. And we have to re-examine all these rules that we've built up over the years mm. with that new public health lens, lens about how to reduce the chance of the next pandemic. It's gonna come, it's, it's how to reduce the likelihood of it and how to be pre, better prepared um, to, to fight it. So each of you in your own respective fear, spheres and fears, <laughs> slip of the tongue there, um, tell me what you've taken from the COVID-19 phenomenon. Who's going to dive in first? <laughs> That's a big question. Um, wear a mask, uh, the, but um, <laughs> the, the benefits I, of which are still much discussed in scientific circles. I, uh, let's go on. <laughs> I, uh, I just, I'm going to. I think that the amount, I think the amount of digital transformation, as the term goes, that the world went through because of COVID, everybody hopped online. We learned how to do things like this. Um, you know, we are learning to work together and to create in a new way that I, I believe is going to filtrate down into the systems we develop for prevention. Um, I can't speak, you know, I'm not a medical uh, person in that way. Um, so, but I think that you know, right now we were forced into making a foundation that is actually going to help many things um, in the future. I can't even say what they are, but I just know that what we have been forced to do um, through this terrible uh, circumstance, the next time we will we will be able to iterate faster. But I think in the meantime, we are just going to be able to work better towards solutions um, in a new way. Uh, thank you. I, I would. So, so, sorry, Ian. No. Uh, okay. Yes, uh, I was just going to say, kind of living living here in Kenya, where we've just watched, as as it would be the case, you know, anywhere else, that the tourism has completely and totally died, and the 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 the, the level of reliance uh, that the national parks here, the protected areas here, that the protected areas everywhere else have on that tourism income in order to to create the support for the species, for the habitats, even for the communities around, 
it's just so a sing, you know, it's just so single threaded against, I, I, for, for, you know, in, in terms of that particular income stream. Um, and our need, you know, I think the, one of the biggest things that struck is, is, is our need to diversify the ways that different people can support conservation in different ways has just, you know, has just risen, you know, has just risen to the, risen to the top. Um, and we don't know what's, you know, we don't know what's going to happen next, but if, if everything relies on one income stream or two income streams, um, I think, you know, we're going to continue to be in trouble. So, you know, that's, that's especially being here and just seeing it firsthand uh, and hearing it firsthand. Uh, that's probably one of the biggest things that struck me. Yes. Thank you. It's an important uh, point to make. Um, and indeed echoes, our earlier uh, session on, on innovative finance, mm. because j just as conservation for most people is an externality, it's not part of their everyday life. Um, yeah. So conservation funding um, has always been something over there. Well, you put your, your, your donation into the charity box yeah. or, or a little exactly bit of right. your tax money goes to it, but it's got to become internalized into the economy, yeah. just as we internalize conservation into our daily lives. Um, I have a note saying that, that Sarah, there's an 11 year old who's really keen th that you should um, just say hi. I don't know the 11 year old's name, but I bet you do. <laughs> hi, Kate. How are you? <laughs> okay. Um, and a comment from um, Carrie uh, Ash Aspie, who, who writes, I'm a wellness coach and I'm using wildlife conservation as a foundation to help my clients progress. By doing this, I'm inspiring a shift in the relationships people have with wildlife. It's the mindset change that Sarah just mentioned. Yogis are conservationists too. And as a part-time yoga practitioner, I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Does that ring any bells? Are you talking to me? Well, I, I don't know. The, the, all of you have to have to keep. You know, it's one of the hardest things about conservation is to be daily bombarded with all the negative data, and somehow yeah. we have to. So Fine. I, well, yes. Um, once I opened this, it's almost like a Pandora's box, right? Like once you find out about anything, you start to learn, um, and especially, you know, this. Um, I mean, Project Fifteen is named after the amount of time that we lose an elephant on this planet, and it was that name. We kept that name on purpose. I mean, I, I named it, and and I wanted to change that number. Um, till it just wasn't a relevant sort of name. Um, at the same time, uh, I get, I've been meeting all these folks that are working on this so hard. Um, and the hope, here comes the hope that you, you know, it's terrible facts, but if you can just, you'll see all the wonderful work that's being done and being, you know, using a growth mindset where you don't just come in and start learning about it and then figure out how you can help because everybody can help. And so that for me, you know, hits that it is a very di difficult topic. Um, I won't look at any of the terrible pictures, but um, at the same time, you'll hear, you know, you'll find people like I've met the people that Timothy was talking about um, that did the Heathrow project. And I was like, oh, I should tell him about, oh, he already knows. Wonderful. Okay. So you learn that it's a small community of people doing amazing stuff. And then you can figure out how you can help, whether you're an 11 year old watching this show and doing your own thing to, to, to what can I do as an 11 year old and what can I do as an adult? to make sure I'm giving the next generation the right tools to get going, whether it's a game for awareness or it's teaching them the skills so they can hit the ground running to make these solutions. It's gonna fall on them. So it's a long-winded answer to say it's hopeful within its um, difficulties when you're learning about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I really think um, in a lot of ways, COVID, I mean, COVID's, uh, the pandemic's, creating a lot of challenges like been discussed. Um, but two things, one, they're creating challenges for, for wildlife traffickers also. Uh, you know, they have to shift, they they can't travel, they can't do the same things that, you know, that, that they were doing. Uh, so in, in any kind of, um, you know, so in, in any kind of situation like that, that's a big vulnerability for them. Also on our side, on the good side, uh, you know, I think in a lot of ways the stars are aligning. I mean, you have, you have, you know, incredibly, you know, um, powerful uh, 
partners now, you know, that can really do a lot. Microsoft, uh, you know, the transport industry, the ship, uh, the air, bank industry, uh, law enforcement, U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, is really expanding their their international presence. You know, so so now there's actually you know there's an international there's a law enforcement agency that's working you know internationally exclusively on transnational wildlife crime. That's never been the case before. Uh, I think there's a lot of kind of the dysfunctions of, of the conservation um, world, I think are, you know, are, are, are being noticed now and, and taken more seriously than they ever were before. And I think that's opening up a lot of opportunities. And, and there's this big, big democratization, diversification, like Gautam said, of the conservation space. So I think, I think there's a lot of really positive things. I think the challenge is, kind of going forward, is how well can we sync all of this up so for effect, right? And so that's going to be because if we have a million different great projects going on, which are not coordinating with each other and, and are not kind of moving things forward strategically, not just tactically, you know, then we end up with the war on drugs, which is tactical success, but you know, uh, you know, you win all the battles but lose the war. And so, but I think we have a, an opportunity through all these different things, uh, yeah, to you know, to not repeat that. Uh, mistake and, and and really end this. Uh, let's let's hope so because uh, <laughs> there's a lot at stake here, like the future of life on Earth. Um, th there are requests here for people to flag up where um, work can be found. So I don't know if each of you wants to give an easy um, website. Um, Add a asks, um, I understand Ethiopia's new airport is very elaborate. You work with the Ethiopian government, Tim, to sort of <clears throat> prove their airport security from a wildlife crime point of view. Um, maybe like with many things in Ethiopia, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, all of it is. And the thing that struck me from all that you said um, was, was the question of cyber security. And I had a very rude awakening to that this morning actually world wildlife day for me was supposed to start with a lecture to um, an audience in india and the the event was hacked and and propaganda and and images that had no place on, on a, <laughs> a presentation were being and they had to pull the thing so so when you're working with people of the same mindset it's fantastic to have all this data sharing but if if as you say someone can bribe you to get the, the pass that reveals where the rhinos are or which shipment can be flagged through without being checked um then we're just making it easier for the the cyber criminal so um i, I know that's a whole new topic to to delve into and i just invited you to tell people where to find more information about your work if people are interested in the thing that i was talking about um the putting the the carbon value attributable to elephants to work in development and conservation the website is really easy um rebalance.earth i challenge each of you to have a similarly easy uh, website for people to uh, follow up on what you've been telling us um sarah do you want to go first sure uh if you want to learn more about project 15 it, we have uh, you can go to aka.ms uh WAC, uh project 15. Uh, maybe uh, Adi can put it in the chat. Thank you. And I'm sure that just searching for Microsoft Project 15 would probably find yeah, it. That'll work too. <laughs> uh, I, I recommend you using Ecosia, the search engine that plants trees. Uh, oh. Tim, what, what's, what's your favorite website for people to look at? Uh, well, yes, yeah, so, I mean, for our, for our work, uh, focusconservation.org, uh, unitedforwildlife.org, um, also the Royal Foundation's website. Uh, and um, yes, yeah, and also uh, feel free to contact me personally on LinkedIn. It's probably you know, one of the easiest ways. Um, yeah. So and yeah, welcome. More contact. Especially if someone has ideas that can help with the the, the work. Yeah. And uh, yeah. go time I mean, just before we go. Share information and connect people. So thank you. Yeah. So if you want to learn more about uh, Internet of Elephants and all the different products we do, it's www.internetofelephants.com. Um, and if you want to play the game that we released just yesterday about the camera trap uh, work, it's unseenempire.com. Fantastic. Well, that was a wide ranging and, and amazing sharing of ideas and, and to some extent life stories. Um, thank you all for joining us today. 
and I hope that people respond and, and come forward with ideas and, and just become part of this movement, which is what we're really trying to achieve, a, a global movement to uh, redevelop our relationship with nature. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you.